So welcome everybody. Uh, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. We're delighted to welcome you back for the beginning of the fall edition of the Future of Democracy Lecture Series, a collaboration between the Institute for Public Knowledge at NU and the Governance Lab. Uh, we like to do these conversations, as you know, on a regular basis, where we have a discussion about the ways in which technology is impacting democracy. This is, for the benefit of our guests, a very hopeful and optimistic conversation. So we are eager to both diagnose the challenges and the problems, but at the same time to also reimagine what democracy can be and how technology can help us to achieve that future. So I am very delighted to kick off this fall series with three wonderful guests whom we have here. Uh, their bios are so impressive and so long that it would cut into the time we have for conversation with them. So what we're going to do is to paste their bios in the chat for Rob and Jeremy and Mehram. But what's important to note, um, let's turn off my phone. <laughs> they are uh, um, authors of an important new book called System Error, reviewed today in the Wall Street Journal. We'll paste the link both for uh, uh, their bios and that review in the chat for you. And we will dive in right away to our conversation. For those of you joining us on, um, for those of you joining us uh, uh, via Twitter on the live stream, we invite you to come into the Zoom room and join us for the conversation so that you can ask questions and be fully engaged. For those of you who are in the room with us, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom to uh, ask your questions. We invite you by all means to use the chat, to have conversations, to introduce yourselves. We love the back channel and the chatter, but if you'd actually like to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A so that we can actually make sure to parse them out of the, uh, uh, out of the chatter, uh, really pull them up and see them front and center and really work them into our discussion. So let's actually dive in here. Many of you probably saw the piece in uh, uh, the Times this week. A lot of news coverage has been had about the Theranos trial and Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, a lot of discussion about, in fact, whether the trial and her prosecution is, in fact, sexist. But what the, time asked, the Times really asked the question, I think, quite poignantly, not whether we should or shouldn't prosecute her, but why it is that we aren't prosecuting more people in Silicon Valley. Why it is, and you make this point in the book and you are the three of you at Stanford in the heart of, the, of, the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, we have a tremendous number of obviously engineers there, computer scientists. We have graduated 65,000 CS grads in the United States in the last year. That number has gone up 7.5% just in the last year alone. We have more and more people aspiring to be computer scientists and engineers. And yet you make this point that I think is really profoundly uh, brought to the fore by this trial, that so much of what Silicon Valley produces, any products that are innovative and disruptive are actually quite socially deleterious. So I wanted to start the conversation off by asking you, what is it about the way that we're training technologists? What is it about the engineer's mindset, as you put it, that's giving rise to these challenges, that's leading to creation of tech that unfortunately is more harmful than it is beneficial for democracy? So if I could uh, uh, ask you, Rob, to start it off that way. Super. Well, th thanks so much for, for inviting us um, to have a chance to have this conversation. And since the book is in many respect, respects, uh, ultimately a story about democracy as well as technology, I feel it's especially appropriate to be here in this series and uh, grateful uh, on behalf of all of us for the invitation. Um, you started off the, the question with um, a, a reference, of course, to Elizabeth Holmes, a famous, now infamous Stanford dropout, um, you know, creator of the company Theranos. And one of the things that we we say in in the book, and and it, you know, it it, it it's perhaps uh, counterintuitive, is that a kind of incessant focus on the the virtues or the vices of the founders or the goodness or the badness of our tech leaders, um, leads us astray from understanding the great power grab that big tech companies have managed to to take over our lives and over our societies in the past decade, and. In certain respects, what Elizabeth Holmes is alleged to have done 
you know, to have cheated and deceived uh, both her investors, her own employees, and the public is not especially ethically interesting. You know, in other words, do you, does anyone really believe that Elizabeth Holmes had taken a, an ethics class in college that she would have had a better moral compass? No, you, like either you, you learn not to lie, cheat, or steal in kindergarten, and you don't do it, and we're all fallible, and we all make mistakes, but that there's nothing deeply ethically controversial about this. It was bad if she did what she's alleged to have done. So the much more interesting quarry where our book then begins, System Error, is to think just as you said about the engineer's mindset. And as I'm the philosopher of the group, um, um, I've been in Silicon Valley for 25 years, but I really hadn't started spending time in the engineering quad with Meron and the computer science students until about five years ago. And the kind of thing that struck me over and over again Again, was that there was something very distinctive about the way that computer scientists talked and thought about their work. And that distinctive property is that they're optimizers. They have an optimization mindset that they bring to the table, both for their technical work and because they happen to be obsessed with optimization, it spills over into a kind of life orientation, life hacking to optimize various things about our work and then optimizing as one of our colleagues at Stanford often tells his students, everything in life is ultimately an optimization problem. Now, why would you think, why would anybody think optimization could be problematic? If you can you know, increase the efficiency of delivering an output or have fewer inputs to get the same output, optimization is just simply a good thing. And that's exactly where we want to, as it were, intervene or attack in, in the problem. Optimization, is only a means to accomplishing some objective or end. And if you don't pick a good objective or a good end, optimization can lead you astray in a number of different ways and actually um, unsettle and make the world worse. So first, the obvious way it can do that is if you choose a, a bad objective, a morally bad objective, and you optimize for it, you make the world more worse or you know, um, it's a bad thing to optimize. And secondly, there are many things in life in which we don't want maximal efficiency. And that's because we're balancing a multiplicity of values. So we use a couple of examples in the book. We, we put speed bumps on roads because we don't want always to optimize the speed at which cars can travel because we have other concerns in addition to, in addition to efficiently getting to a destination, there's safety concerns. We don't tell juries optimize your, your deliberations so that you deliver the verdict in as little time as possible. We tell them to consider the stakes and to make sure they engage in their fellow, with their fellow jurors about um, the, the guilt or innocence of, of the party. Um, when we ask of our media outlets on election night, they might have polling that indicates who the almost certain winner is, but we don't optimize the reporting because we think it's important to allow the final voters in the last hour that the poll stations are open still to cast their ballot and so on and so forth. So um, we don't always want to optimize an outcome, but let me wrap this up just by saying there's one more really important part that I've learned from hanging out now with Meron and the computer scientists, which is that even if you have a good objective, you have to do something that you, know, you could call, it has to be computationally tractable. It has to be quantifiable in order to measure your progress toward that particular end. And so what computer scientists and programs are always looking for is a proxy as, an, as a measure of the ultimate objective, a proxy that's computationally tractable. And so many things that we strive in life to try to bring about with the mission statements of the big tech companies, you know, connecting people if you're, if you're, if you're Facebook, those things aren't easily amenable to a computationally tractable single objective or single proxy. And so you get things like, well, we'll measure human connection just by counting the number of people who are signed up for the service, or we'll optimize for engagement on the platform, or we'll optimize for time spent on the platform. Those are poor proxies. And suddenly what happens sometimes with technologists is that they end up thinking that those are the intrinsically valuable things and optimizing for them is their job. That leads, I think, many things astray. Final last thing, the optimizers are people who often don't care about democracy. Um, 
Why? Because democracy is itself an institutional design that's not meant to be an optimizing orientation to the world. It's meant to be a fair process for refereeing the different preferences and values of citizens in an ongoing way. So that's why technologists sometimes complain, it seems to me, about democratic institutions, because they're not optimizing for something. And they're right, but it's because they have a profound misunderstanding of what democracy is good for. So maybe since let's pick up on that uh, uh, discussion about democracy, and Jeremy, let me bring you into the conversation here. Um, there's a distinctly kind of libertarian, libertarian ethos to uh, the Silicon Valley approach to democracy, to this optimization concept, and a real sense, I think, and we've seen it from the ProPublica reporting, um, Abigail Disney writing in The Atlantic about how Silicon Valley tech billionaires don't want to pay taxes to Washington because they feel they can do it better. You know, Washington is inefficient. Democracy is the worst system of government except all others. Um, and maybe the view is except the apps that we can build in some way. Um, so I'm curious about kind of why, at least metaphorically, if it's true that Sand Hill Road is really very, very far from Washington. And as somebody who spent a lot of time in Washington, also so at the UN, in institutions of government, I'm wondering sort of how you uh, explain in some way uh, this mindset of, uh, or the hostility, as I perceive it from your book, of Silicon Valley to institutions of government and to Washington from your perspective, having been inside the Beltway. So regulation is, is a bad word out here in Silicon Valley. When, when people use the word regulation, what it brings to mind for them is efforts by the state, by the government, to slow down the process of scientific progress, to impede innovation, to stand in the way of things that improve people's lives. Uh, and that reflects this distinctly libertarian orientation that we see among the founders. But one of the things that, that we say in the book and that we say to our students, because we're engaged you know, as professors in, in, in the exercise of educating the next generation of technologists, is that regulation has been given a bad name. It's just a loaded word for something that's really important, which is the act of collective self-governance, the work that we do outside of the, the quiet boardroom where companies are making decisions in their own interest or the, the, the cubicle where someone is coding a particular platform to optimize for time spent on platform or click-throughs to ads. Um, Regulation is the output of an exercise, a process, a technology that we use to referee the kinds of value trade-offs that Rob just described. And I think when you hear Silicon Valley sort of poo-poo democracy, right? Let, let's be clear what it is that they are articulating a preference for, which is the reliance on a set of beneficent corporate leaders, experts, right? Um, who run companies whose interest is primarily driven by a bottom line and responsibility to their own pocketbooks and the shareholders rather than to the public interest. And democracy is the antidote to that kind of orientation. And of course, as you rightly noted with the Churchill quote, democracy has a lot of problems. We're at a moment of extreme polarization, a moment of paralysis in many of our legislative institutions and gridlock. On the other hand, democracy is slow and deliberate for a reason. That is, it goes through the exercise of surfacing the kinds of disagreements that exist about the kind of society that we want to live in, and then creating a fair process where people can be heard, and then ultimately trying to arrive at the guardrails that we want to create. And so when Silicon Valley expresses its anti-regulatory you know, trope or anti sort of government orientation, let's be clear about what it is that they're arguing for. And the discomfort that many of us should have in a moment where the deleterious social consequences are so visible with relying on and ceding to technologists and the venture capitalists who fund them decisions that have implications for all of us. The last thing I just say is that, you know, one of the conversations that I have with our young technologists who are socialized into this anti-government, anti-regulation mode is I asked them whether they drank milk in the morning and whether they got sick from the milk that they drank. And I asked them where their t-shirt was produced and do they have a rash on their skin as a function of the t-shirt that they're wearing? 
The regulatory state is everywhere. The regulatory state is there when we drive on the road and we know to drive on the right-hand side and not on the left-hand side and to stop at a stoplight. And what we need in the, in the context of big tech is that underlying set of rules of fair play, of attention to social harms, of, of responsibility for mitigating some of these social consequences that's been absolutely missing. And that's not an unreasonable thing to ask for, nor do I think it's unreasonable to expect that those decisions would be made by us collectively and not in a corporate boardroom. So let's get specific about some specific technologies uh, and where these kinds of tensions are playing themselves out. So as the technologist, Miran, maybe I can bring you in at this point into the conversation. Let me say that one of the things that this book does absolutely beautifully um, and uh, it makes me really want to take the course that you're teaching at Stanford, which I'll come back to in a moment, um, is that you beautifully really portray the landscape of all the battlegrounds where these debates are taking place. So from algorithms uh, to autonomous cars, um, to uh, AI and hiring, to social media and free speech, what I love about this is you cover the waterfront that also makes it a really exciting book to read and is super fast paced. Uh, and so I can't commend it to people enough is it really just gives you the whole lay of the landscape, um, which I think is a, really a service in a world in which most academics are writing very narrow monographs on one specific thing. So that said, I do wanna ask you though to be somewhat specific um, and to really dig in on one or two of these battlegrounds um, whether it's governance of algorithms or autonomous vehicles, you pick, I leave it up to you, but maybe you could let us know how this kind of tensions are playing out as you see it as a technologist, um, and then how that differs from how we see it as, as a political scientist and a political philosopher. Well, thanks for the kind words about the book. I think the important thing for people- And, to take I, and I even read it, I can tell you, based on actually having read it. <laughs> that that's wonderful. That's even better. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to do that. I think the important message for people to take away is just how big of an impact technology is having in their lives in a lot of ways that they may not even know. There's the applications that we you know, use on a daily basis and we have some impact or some notion of the impact of that. But for example, for algorithmic decision making now, substantive decisions in people's lives are being made around, for example, who gets access to credit, who gets a mortgage, they're in our dating apps as to who gets matched with whom, they're part of the criminal justice system now, who gets released on bail and who doesn't, is increasingly being done by algorithms as opposed to by the judges themselves. And this goes on and on in the medical domain, who gets medical care, what kind of care they're approved for. And in many cases, people don't know or understand that algorithms are making these, these decisions behind the scenes and how how those algorithms came into existence. So many of these things are based on a technology called machine learning, which has gained prominence in the last decade as a way to analyze patterns and data to be able to make predictions. So for example, in the medical domain, we might look at different sorts of medical procedures that were approved and what sorts of outcomes they led to, and then decide we're gonna use that pattern now to decide who gets particular medical care in the future. The problem with that in, in these technologies in general is that they create a mirror for our society in the sense that they are under the guise of being objective, reinforcing patterns that already existed in human decision making. So if there were biases when judges made decisions about who got granted bail or not, if there were biases around who got access to medical care, or it was based on things like socioeconomic status, what hospitals people had access to, what kind of care they had access to, that data is now the data that's being used to train these algorithms. And so one of the things we talk about in the book is this creates all kinds of issues around bias under the guise of being objective. And we need to think about things like having algorithmic transparency so people know when these algorithms are being uh, applied. We need to have accountability so that there is actually some sort of auditing done of these algorithms to see if they have gender bias or racial bias. And we provide lots of examples in the book of cases where this has actually happened. And ultimately, we need due process so people can challenge the, the results of these algorithms.
To give you one more example, we also talk about you know, artificial intelligence or AI writ large and the impact that that's going to have on the labor force going forward. And depending on which statistics you look at and who you read, it's estimated that between 9 and 43 percent of jobs will be impacted by AI in the next 10 years. So we're talking about a short time frame and a huge potential upheaval to the labor force. Well, if we want to think about that, we need to understand what are solutions there that really require policy intervention, right? We need to think about large-scale education and reskilling to be able to get the job force properly aligned with these changes that happen in technology. We need to think about how we augment the social safety net, whether or not something like universal basic income would actually make sense in a regime like this, and ultimately what kind of decisions we feel comfortable for AI to make for us. Right. Do we want to replace a radiologist with an algorithm because we think it's slightly more accurate in terms of how well it diagnoses cancer? Or do we want a human being at our bedside telling us that we potentially have a terminal disease and holding our hand through that process? So these are the kinds of issues we need to grapple with in the not that future term. And that was part of the impetus for bringing up these issues in the book is we want people to really understand what the technologies are capable of and what they're not capable of so they can demand better solutions going forward. I'm gonna just put one more question back to you before we uh, continue, which is there's a technology you describe in the book that I think is so important and that not everybody may have heard of, especially if we have a lot of political scientists and philosophers in, in the room with us, which is GPT-3. And I'm wondering uh, if you can just quickly explain to us what that is, why it matters, and why it's one of these battleground technologies. Sure. So GPT-3 is a large language model. And what it means by language model is it's trying to generate human language, natural language like English. And the way it's done this is it's basically built a model of patterns of human generated text and it's digested a huge amount of text. So we're talking many, many terabytes of text, like, you know, orders of magnitude greater than the entire contents of the Library of Congress, because it's basically all the information you can find on the web. And the way this language model works, it's actually fairly simple. What it's trying to do is predict the next word based on the sequence of words it's seen so far to generate language. And it just keeps doing that. And so if you just generate a sequence of words, suddenly you find yourself creating passages of text. And the amazing thing, the thing about this is it's digested so much text that it actually generates text that sounds very plausible for humans to have generated. So it becomes a way for, say, a seventh grader to generate an essay for their class. That's kind of the one more innocuous approach. It can be used to potentially displace some jobs like generating marketing copy, but it can also be used for near very nefarious purposes, which in fact it, it has, which are things like, how can I generate misinformation, but do it at a scale that makes it appear slightly personalized or customized and then be able to disseminate it out there to sway public opinion. So these are the kinds of things we need to think about for this technology is it can have potentially positive uses, but also can intentionally be harnessed for harm. Can I hop in here? Beth, just to add something to that, because I'm really glad you brought up GPT-3. It's not something that's widely known or understood quite yet. And the, the, we end the, the book, um, the last chapter begins with a short discussion of GPT-3, precisely because it's a frontier technology that very few people understand. And um, its social implications, we think, are indeed so powerful for the reasons Maron described. You know, there's a kind of cutesy way we sometimes talk about it. Um, what you do is you give GPT-3 or a large language model a prompt. So the prompt could be, as we did six months ago, um, the following paragraph contains blurbs for the new book by a philosopher, a public policy expert, and a computer scientist at Stanford called System Error, where big tech went wrong and how we can reboot. The book existed nowhere online. So it, it's not as if the, the model could somehow have ingested the text of the book. And we just asked the, the GPT-3 language model to produce a bunch of blurbs. They're um, completely plausible and convincing. And what we, we have is a little exercise we sometimes do with people. We show people the actual blurbs that were given to us by humans, and then the list of GPT-3 blurbs. And most people cannot tell the difference. Now imagine the seventh grader, Maron described it as the kind of innocent thing. I mean, th this is the this is the 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 death of 
plagiarism software because every time you would put an input in, write me an essay about you know Animal Farm uh, with the following ideas, you can get a plausible three-page essay um, that's totally unique. So it's not as if you purchased it online. And it gets more nefarious still for misinformation and disinformation. The language models contain some bias. So there have been studies done that show things like if you say two Muslims walk into a mosque and you ask GPT-3 to, to complete the, another paragraph, you get things that are, are on the order of, and in their backpacks, they have various explosive devices. They're just perpetuating the, the awful stereotypes that exist in the world. And, and these, these biases are so deep in the model that you can even put a prompt to the model that says, two Muslims peacefully walk into a mosque and begin to pray. And still the output reinforces a set of negative stereotypes. And since you can't trace this to a machine, imagine this in the hands of a misinformation or disinformation advers adversary who now can flood social media with this at extremely low cost in a way that can't be traced. And those are the frontier issues we confront with some of the power of technology over our lives. Well, let me bring Jeremy back into the conversation here um, and to really double down on this question of what are we going to do about this. And this is obviously a conversation very much about democracy and technology. Um, so we want to sort of ask the question about how democratic institutions respond and whether they're capable of responding. So Pew Research and Alone University collaborate every year. You'll probably respond to these surveys about um, tech and democracy. And the headline from this year's survey is many tech experts say digital disruption will hurt democracy. So that's the top level headline. Um, and yet you come out kind of ultimately optimistic, I would say, about the power of democratic institutions to be able to respond to the downsides of technology. Um, so, so the question is, am I reading that correct, that you're ultimately optimistic that, dem that our democratic institutions can and will respond effectively? Um, and or are our current, what do we need to ch change about our current institutions to be able to respond more effectively? And here I'm just going to, you know, single out the um, example, which is, is, was so obvious for many of us, you pointed out in the book, which was the hearing, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's hearing on Capitol Hill last year, which was cringeworthy, as my middle schooler likes to say, um, to watch the you know, performance of members of Congress who clearly don't know where the on switch is on their computers. So given that, they barely know what Facebook is, they surely don't know what GPT-3 is, how optimistic are you about the power and ability of these rather inefficient democratic institutions to respond to these challenges? Uh, so Jeremy, let me... Well, thanks for the question, uh, Beth. Um, you know, I think our view ultimately is that that governing a society transformed by technology is one of the existential challenges for democracy over the next set of decades. And, and, and going in you know, to the book and sort of investigating each of these issues, issue by issue, where the value trade-offs are clear, the deleterious consequences are accumulating all around us, it's fundamentally clear to us that there isn't an alternative arena in which to grapple with these harmful social consequences other than in our politics and in our democratic politics. So, so what gives me hope in that sense? So the first is that, you know, you pointed to the, the interaction that, that Zuckerberg had with senators where senators evinced a total lack of understanding of, of the, the Facebook business model. We've seen that clip played over and over again. Um, but look at where we are three years later, two years later in the United States, a really credible and in-depth House Judiciary investigation uh, with bipartisan support of anti-competitive practices by the large technology companies. The beginning of active uh, enforcement efforts by the FTC, but in collaboration with state attorney generals across both Republican and Democratic states. Uh, states themselves pursuing legislative action like California on privacy with the California Consumer Privacy Act, following the lead of Europe with its GDPR uh, focused on data privacy. So we are moving into a policy moment and a policy window 
where we're bringing together not only an understanding of the harms that are out there, but also active debate and deliberation over the solution set. And for the, for the near-term issues and maybe even the low-hanging fruit issues like algorithmic auditing and data privacy and data portability, those solutions are really within reach and they're really possible for bipartisan agreement. Some of the issues like antitrust or content moderation are much more areas where there are concerns on both sides, but potentially not yet a meeting of the minds. Um, but I don't look at this as a set of problems to be solved in one electoral cycle, in one administration. Ultimately, as we've seen democracy respond to the challenges posed by new technologies, going back to the telegraph or the telecommunications revolution, these are things that take years, decades, to get your regulatory state to be responsive um, and to be responsive and to forge agreement. And so that's point one. I actually think we're at a very different moment than that hearing. Uh, that people often point to, and we need to recognize the progress that's being made and the possibility that's there. Point number two, and this is what comes up from the GPT-3 example, is just right now our policymakers are solving or trying to solve the problems that are right under their nose. Those are the problems of the last decade. Those are not the problems necessarily of the next decade. And this gets to work that you've done both in your public service career uh, and work you've done coming out of, of, of NYU and, and uh, the GovLab, which is that we need a government that is far better able to understand what technology is about, to diagnose and identify potential consequences, uh, both intended and unintended of new technologies, and much more flexible and adaptable in its approach to regulation. A good model of how this is happening uh, is, is the rollout of self-driving cars in the sense that you've got a new technology here and instead of rolling it out to everyone overnight, you're rolling it out in states with clear regulatory guardrails to try and understand how human beings interact with this new technology. And what do we discover? Well, despite what you tell human beings, they still sit in the, in the back seat streaming Netflix without control over the wheel when they've been told explicitly not to. And as a result, accidents happen. And so one way that people think about what that dynamic is, is they think about regulatory sandboxes and notions of adaptive governance. So not just correcting these problems once they're observed and affecting our society at scale, but creating environments in which you can really test and explore hypotheses about technology's potential harmful consequences. You know, our former colleague, shared colleague, Nicole Wong, uh, you know, who served in government as the deputy chief technology officer after you, calls this a slow food movement for tech, that we need a slow food movement where we're approaching these things in a very deliberate way. And the last thing I just say is that our book, though optimistic about the potential of democracy, is not optimistic only about the role of our political institutions in grappling with these effects, but also the potential emergence of an ethic of responsibility within tech itself. And we see that emerging among our students, and of course, these companies are actively competing every day to attract our students to work for them. But we also see it in the workers in tech companies who are raising concerns, not only about the countries that their companies share products with, sell products to, the collaborations that they have with the national security state, the ways in which they handle issues of race and diversity and sexual harassment within their firms. There is a moment of the realization of the agency that exists in the hands of tech workers which is gonna be an absolutely central part of generating the change that we want, right? Pressure from the state, pressure from the workers, pressure from civil society, pressure from accountability journalism, as we saw with the Wall Street Journal last week. And that's what's gonna generate the momentum that we need to put our democracy to work. So let me uh, first let everybody know that I'm gonna open up the floor to questions in just a moment and bring in uh, other voices and questions. We have some amassing in the chat. I'm getting some back channel. I'll uh, take a look on Twitter for those questions. So just a, a, a fair warning to walk up to the virtual mic to uh, post your question now, and then I'll open it up. But let me um, use this as an opportunity to bring Rob back into the discussion or anyone else who wants to chime in um, and bring in a question that we have in the Q&A. back to talking about how we're training people. So we had somebody who in the Q&A anonymously asked and says, tech people and academic workplaces are far from democratic. How do people ever get to know what democracy is? 
And so that relates to a question here that I just want to make sure we talk about the course that this book uh, emanates from uh, um, and grows out of. And I know you said at the beginning that, you know, Elizabeth Holmes needed to learn right from wrong in kindergarten, not when she came to Stanford. Um, but I'm wondering if you could just say a word about this course and what you're doing by bringing together tech policy and philosophy and ethics to really introduce these questions, to talk about them in terms of uh, theory and values, to talk about the fundamental fairness that, that the result here, and to try to train a next generation of employee going into these tech companies. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about this course um, because I think the people you're training, if they go into tech companies and they go into government, we have a little bit of hope that we might accelerate some of the way that we're able to respond to these challenges. So, uh, Rob, can I put that to you? Yeah, great. Well, uh, I'm as the philosopher in, in the lot here, but I think this applies to Jeremy, too. Uh, we share the same department, and so we're in the same building on campus. Over the past decade, we witnessed the great migration of undergraduate students away from the social sciences and humanities over to the School of Engineering to major and now in record numbers in computer science. It wasn't you know, uh, impossible to imagine the reasons. It was pretty clear what it was so attractive about computer science, uh, including the great salaries that were on offer for many of the students who graduated. But um, the, the kind of slow um, initial transition to this juggernaut that engineering education has become and has led to a, a, a you know, kind of conveyor belt in which you hop on the major really early and it's hard work, uh, so it's not as if it's an easy major. And then employers come knocking on your door very early. Yeah, I mean, the path of least resistance isn't to a startup or a big tech company. And when we saw, Jeremy and I, the, um, this great migration on the one hand, and then also all of us understanding that the bloom was off the rose of Silicon Valley and the, the social harms that were imposed by big tech companies on individuals uh, uh, around the world, um, as well as to damaging democracy itself, led us to think that we should try to stage, to the extent that we could, a cultural intervention on campus, and best to do it by trying to teach not a, a class in the political science department or in the philosophy department, but a class that was collaborative and, in, and incorporated the technical perspective and so we went and um, began working with Meron in order to develop this course. It's the only course that we're aware of on campus in which you have to do technical assignments, policy memos, and philosophy papers. Um, so it's not as if it's a checkbox curriculum and you tell the computer science students, be sure you also take that ethics course sometime in your four years. We try to bring all of these things to bear in a single class. Now, the question ultimately was then about, um, how, does this produce anything in terms of democracy? democracy since academic workplaces and tech workplaces aren't themselves democratically organized. That's true. But as I said at the very start, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Holmes, that's an, that's an uninteresting ethical challenge or question. Don't lie, cheat or steal. What are the ethically interesting things that are so important that we think um, have to be conveyed to students as a way of lifting their own agency in the world and their agency both as tech professionals, policymakers, civil society leaders, and most essentially as citizens? Those ethical questions are about the professional ethics of computer scientists in the ways in which there's a, a very, um, I'll call it a kind of light or barely developed professional set of norms that steer and coordinate the work of, of AI scientists or computer scientists as compared to say biomedical researchers or lawyers or doctors. Um, but most importantly are the social and political ethics. And that just goes back to the value trade-offs that we started with at the beginning. Um, we're in the domain, and this is what makes the technologists a little anxious. We're in the domain of better and worse answers, not right and wrong answers. And what that means at the end of the day for me, I sometimes like to set, tell people as a philosopher, I'm in the game of moral caffeination, waking up to the moral complexity of the world because if you're morally sleepwalking, that's not a recipe for confronting the most essential and inescapable challenge, challenges of life as an individual, as a professional, and as a citizen. So waking up to actually identify and confront the values that present themselves to us and the choices we have to make amongst competing values 
is not just the task of being a tech professional, it's the, it's the undertaking of being a human. And um, as a consequence of that, we hope at the end of the day, our class awakens people to exercise their agency wherever they happen to wind up in life, inside Silicon Valley, outside Silicon Valley, and most essentially as a citizen. I have so many questions for you, but I am going to uh, open up the virtual mic and uh, we're going to promote you one at a time to ask your questions. So we have political philosopher and lawyer Joseph Marti from uh, Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona. Thank you. Um, I haven't read the book yet, yet but I'm, I'm uh, really looking forward to it. Um, it sounds uh, like the, the kind of right message that I was waiting for. Um, I, I've been doing research on, on AI and democracy in the uh, last years, and I, I was worried uh, probably along the same lines, right, that we have talked probably already quite a lot about uh, the ethical challenges that AI and, and generally tech puts on, on human societies and our societies. But, but we speak too little about uh, the challenges that it puts also on democracy and for democracy. So I, I celebrate this uh, a lot. And so let, let me share with you my problem and, and see whether you can help me. So I'm serving uh, currently uh, as a member of the uh, Scientific Advisory Board of the Barcelona City Council. Uh, for their for trying to help them to define their strategy on AI, and you know they have all the good intentions. They want to they want it to be ethical. They call it their particular perspective. They call it uh, technological humanism, and they want to bring in uh, all these you know human values and democratic values that we praise. Um, they also want to make it human centered and so on. So, but I. For some reason, I had a hard time convincing them that it's not only the ethical challenges that we should care about, but uh, maybe even more importantly about the democratic challenges. Uh, and when I got, when I convinced them that this is critical, and then they said, okay, what's the solution? And then I had a hard time myself uh, trying to provide solutions. And so for instance, one of the uh, ideas that we came about was, okay, maybe we can create a citizen panel that what might oversee what the city council is doing in terms of giving transparency to the algorithms they are using or the different policies that they are trying to pass on uh, regulating uh, tech, technology and AI. But the thing, I always wonder whether it, this is enough. I mean, you referred to this example of uh, Mark Zuckerberg in the American Congress, uh, and you all agreed that, you know, that uh, was probably not the democracy at its best. Um, but it makes me wonder again, whether uh, if we um, approach this problem with the so-called traditional uh, mechanisms uh, that democracy have created over years, uh, maybe that's not enough. Maybe we should change radically our way of approaching democracy. And this brings me back to the one of the, the first sentences that Rob uh, uh, um, men mentioned, used at the beginning of his talk, when he said, uh, there is a clear distinction between optimization and uh, what democracy does. Democracy is not about optimization. And then I, I, I am wondering why not? I mean, I think I understand that democracy is not only about optimization. I, I agree with Rob that uh, fairness and you know the intrinsic value of democracy points out in different directions. But I also think that we uh, should expect from democracy the having the ability of making good decisions, including making good regulations on AI. So how can we square the circle here? What, what kind of solutions could you bring uh, uh, up to the table that can help me with the Barcelona City Council. Thank you. I love the question. I'll, I'll take a first cut at it. Um, but of course, you know, this is the enterprise that all of us need to engage in, which is figuring out what does it mean to update our political institutions to grapple with challenges that that seem inaccessible and beyond reach. Um, you know, part, part of my answer to the question is that that we have to break these issues like bringing AI into government down into tractable pieces and recognize that different parts of that dynamic require different kinds of regulatory and institutional responses. So before I offer you my take on it, let me tell you what falls short. What falls short is the kinds of exercises that say, you know, in a relatively naive way, let's just bring transparency to the algorithmic space as if we have some naive notion of the way the public engages with elected politicians that people are 
just waiting you know, in their houses to hear that an algorithm is being deployed to allocate you know, city services, policing, health, and education. And once there's transparency, they're learning all of the skills that are required so that they can themselves audit the algorithm and raise concerns. Of course, we know that's not how democracy works. Um, maybe in some ideal state, uh, but not in the state that we actually live in. And so, you know, when you think about the use of algorithms in public processes, you have to think about what are the real issues at stake? So, so one is, what are the goals that we're trying to achieve with the introduction of new technologies in these settings? And you need a first order conversation. And this is a broad and public conversation where elected officials are really the right players. Um, you need a broad and public conversation about what those ends are, some consensus on those ends, and then a really considered evaluation of whether the introduction of new technologies actually helps you achieve those ends. And that means attention to the limits of technologies, what Maron described in terms of biased data and the mirror that these technologies provide of society. And that's a conversation that most politicians are well positioned to engage in and that can generate public debate. Second, you need a conversation about when you're introducing these new technologies, about what are the rights that you want to preserve for people, right? And these are the rights to due process, right? The rights to understand how decisions are being made about you, the right to explainability. And you need to figure out how you embed those rights, uh, you know, the ability to respond, the ability to contest, the ability to understand that people take for granted in all of their other interactions within government. You can't lose those in this new space. But then you've got other issues like, is the algorithm working as intended? What are the effects of the algorithm in the world? Is the algorithm reinforcing biases that exist in the underlying data? And we can't expect that transparency is gonna solve that problem on its own. For that, you can't have a citizen panel. You need expectations around algorithmic auditing alongside the technical capability to do that auditing. Could it be a function of the state? Potentially. Might it be a function of civil society organizations that are resourced to do this work? Absolutely. But is it simply the responsibility of the crowd? I would be reluctant uh, to leave it in that way. And so I think we've got to break down these issues. The first thing is to just sweep away the optimism that says somehow everything is better if we just sprinkle a little bit more technology in. And then we need to figure out what are the particular problems that we're solving for and align institutional models that address each of them. Um. Let me, uh, oops, we lost our next question asker. Uh, oh, oh no, I hid video participants. I think he's there. <laughs> Sorry, Austin, are you there? Yes, there hello. Go. I'm guessing by the question that you might be a grad student in philosophy. <laughs> Am I no, I'm, I, I'm actually a computer science PhD student and I'm a visiting fellow at the Kennedy School in Science and Technology. By all means, let's hear. All Great. right, so, so, so my question is, uh, excellent talk by the way. I'm so excited to read the book this weekend. Um, you know, what is unique about the optimization tech that, that, you, that we started off the discussion with as compared to other technologies like, like Zoom, email, Wikipedia even? Um, you know, the, the contention that, that first was made kind of by Rich was like technology shapes the world and it's more than just a means to an end. It's not just, you know, instrumental. But then Weinstein um, was kind of arguing a little bit that, well, there's these groups of people in the world, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, who are really trying to um, overtake democracy, and it seems so they're doing so ideolo ideologically. And, and so my question is really like, how do we think about the difference between a culture movement versus the technology itself? Like, is it the case people who buy Teslas, I, I don't think they're really naive to technology, and I think they probably know about the self-driving capabilities of our car. And so is it the culture or is it the technology? And, and is it both, and how do we disentangle it? I'll take a first pass at your oh, excellent ahead, question, man. Austin. Oh, oh Maren, you want to go? You go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, Austin, first I'll try out in you a highly reductive um, formula that bridges what you described as my view and Jeremy's view. Um, the formula is this. The distinctive political or ideological orientation of founders in Silicon Valley is libertarian. Um, the orientation of the vast majority of people who work in tech companies is optimizing or optimizers. So if you get a libertarian ideology with a bunch of optimizing employees, what you're optimizing for is the great minimum of government. And that turns out both to be a technical orientation to the internal work of whatever product is being developed, as well as a kind of 
broader social or cultural orientation, if you like. That's how I see the two things being connected. And I'll just add then in a narrower sense that the, the problem we call out in the book is not with optimization as such. There are completely appropriate and defensible and wonderful um, you know, applications of an optimization orientation to certain technical domains. Um, optimization goes back to decision theory and it has been hugely successful in solving certain problems well. The challenge comes in a variety of different senses in which the, the necessity of finding a proxy um, which is not the same thing as the ultimate objective, or succeeding at, at optimizing for one value, but then ignoring a set of other values that we also care about. I don't know if you, if as a, a CS student, you, you, you ever have uh, had a Soylent um, meal replacement powder, but you know we talk about that in the book. It's optimized, it says, for the body's nutritional needs. The founders of the product called food an inefficient delivery mechanism for the, the body's nutritional uh, uh, needs. Well, food has multiple values, social connection, um, cultural identity, taste, and a world in which Soylent is optimized for all of what food is, is a world in which we lose out on those other values. That's both a technical accomplishment as well as then a cultural or social problem. And that's where I see the problem with, it, with the optimization mindset. Mary so the thing I would add to that is that I think many technologists live in an illusion that technology is value neutral, and it's just not. What technology does is it creates a vector for the direction in which solutions are going to be pursued. So let me give you an example. Cryptographic ledgers are something that have come into existence in the last 10 years. What has that done? It's created a proliferation of cryptocurrencies. Does the world need 100 or 1,000 different cryptocurrencies? No. Why do we have them? Because people have found this a way to make money and it's a vector on which they can travel and produce more of these things because that's what the technology is enabled. If you look at machine learning, it does the same thing. Machine learning has a particular architecture to it, which has to do with the analysis of patterns and data. And so when you have that as a hammer in your toolbox, suddenly everything becomes what data can I get and how can I analyze it for those patterns so now I can apply it to something else. That may not seem like a bad thing, but part of it, as Rob alluded to, is what are you optimizing? One of the classic things to optimize in machine learning is the accuracy of a system, which seems like a reasonable thing. I want it to be as accurate as possible. Well, part of the problem with accuracy is it has a value built into it, which is essentially optimizing for the masses. I can do very well in accuracy by optimizing for the vast majority of people and ignoring the needs of the minority. And so when you think about that, it seems like a very you know, technical issue. I'm just applying machine learning and optimizing accuracy. And a lot of people do that without understanding the value judgments that are actually built into a system like that. And that's why we bring this multidisciplinary lens to these issues is thinking about, okay, how does one think about the rights of the minority in a broader system? How do we try to inquire Incorporate that into what we might actually try to measure around fairness. What kind of guardrails do we put in from a public policy standpoint, sort of vis-a-vis -vis the last question, to be able to measure these things so that people who don't understand all the details of optimization or machine learning can still understand that an algorithm is making different decisions for white people versus black people. So at some point, we can elevate these issues to a place where the public can understand it and weigh in on what they want to see and then have that trickle back into what the technology really should do. So let me do a quick procedural announcement just to let people know with the indulgence of our panelists, what we will do is at 6 p.m. We will end the live stream and the formal portion of our program, and we will adjourn to what I like to call virtual wine and cheese cubes. That means we promote everybody who's here to panelists uh, so that we can have a more informal conversation. So if you've asked a question and it hasn't gotten answered yet, please do stick around because our speakers, I think, will be willing to stick around a little longer, take a few more questions and chat with you. So please bear with us. But maybe we'll take one last question on the list. Uh, um, uh, we can take Natalie's question if you see it um, and uh, bring that into the discussion. So maybe somebody wants to grab it and uh, restate the question briefly and then uh, answer it for us. All right, Beth, this is the question that says, hi, I'm a philosophy grad student, correct? Yes. Okay, well, the question is about um, 
uh, refusal uh, of technology? Are there technologies that shouldn't even exist at all? And how do we refrain from submitting to a kind of narrative or expectation of inevitability um, that tech giants often depend upon? Um, it, yeah, I, I think this is an important question. Uh, I sometimes, just to, to suggest um, um, one path that I often take when encountering a question like this is um, I'm aware of the fact that in a, in a setting that's outside of philosophy, which is to say most settings in which any real problems um, um, get solved in the real world, um, we don't really want philosopher kings or queens um, doing all of the work for the rest of us. Uh, when the philosopher shows up, there's a kind of worry or an anxiety that now the, like, the, moral, the moral police have arrived and the philosopher is gonna tell us all the things we shouldn't be doing. And it's gonna slow things down and make us all feel anxious and you know, guilty or some version of that. And by contrast, as I described before with the, this idea of moral caffeination, I like to convey an orientation to her thinking philosophically that is, you're going to have to confront the complexity of the moral world, whether you like it or not. And this is an energizing orientation, like wake up and feel the excitement as it were about this necessary feature of human existence. Now, all of that's fine, but I think Natalie, you're ultimately also correct. What philosophy can sometimes bring to the table is an identification of things that we could call a human right or a basic entitlement, um, things that we should leave out of an optimizing calculus um, that we should block from ever happening. Now, whether that gets applied to a technology as such is an interesting and open question because as we discussed briefly in the book, one of the common sort of narratives that we hear whenever concerns about a technology are brought to bear or regulation from Washington is threatened is well, if, if we don't give a full berth to Silicon Valley and the technologists, then China dot, 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 and we'll lose out in some geopolitical competition. That's a false choice to pose to people. So there are important ways of refusing technology or blocking its development. And I think those are worth pursuing. Um, and I would wanna harness that question then to the common answer given by a technologist, which is that, well, if you block us from doing it, someone else is, and that's gonna make it worse for all of us. We need to have an answer to that question too. So oh, in the, I think it would be great as we transition to virtual wine and cheese uh, to pick up the question that's in the chat from uh, Genia Pan uh, uh, that really gets the question about neoliberal ideology and capitalism. You know, can we do any of this in a really in a free market system? Uh, uh, so maybe we can pick that up, but what we will do is we will end the formal portion of our program. So if you're watching this on the live stream, as most of you I imagine are, please join us in the room. We'll, uh, again, on Twitter, you can find the link to join us via Zoom. If you are with us in Zoom, please do hang on. What we're going to do is promote everybody, um, so, and, we were gonna, and we're going to continue our conversation. Uh, and I want for those people who are leaving us uh, via live stream or otherwise to formally thank our authors of System Error, run out and get it. It's the best, easiest, most just fluent read on the tech challenges that we're facing today and how we can all respond to them. Uh, and these are very much um, probably the most profound questions of our time. So Miran, Rob, Jeremy, thank you so very much and congratulations on the new book. Uh, we put a link in the chat for everybody, but stick around for um, Zoom Wine and Cheese and we will uh, port everybody in from cyberspace to continue the conversation that also give you guys a moment to take a look at the questions that are waiting for you, which we will continue to answer. Thank you to the Institute for Public Knowledge and to GovLab. And we will be having our next talk um, featuring IPK director Eric Kleinenberg and yours truly talking about my new book um, uh, in October. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, thanks, everybody, and stay tuned. We'll continue the conversation in a moment.